for uh, the, the the very few that listen to our show that aren't familiar with your story, um, you know, I want to talk about your beginnings of the culture. Like for you, well, okay, you're a DJ. Um, mm-hmm. What, first of all, what, like, what environment did you grow up in as far as like your your love of music? Did you grow up in a, in a sort of an open format household where music was prevalent or you know how did my granddad my dad was a soul singer he sung he was the first soul singer to sing with the lebron brothers lebron brothers is a latin band that's a well well renowned latin band that's towards the world right now and they made an album in 1960 they made two albums they made one in 68 and 169 he was the first soul singer with a Latin band, and then he left and started doing Northern Soul himself, and he, he became really good. He had a record called Baby Hard Times in '73 that did good for him. So he was always, you know, doing his thing. My grandfather, his what, father, what was his name? Dave Love. He had okay. a record called Baby Hard Times, and okay. his father, my grandfather, he was a trumpet player, which I have his trumpet he brought in 1940. He used to sit in with Miles Davis, Count Basie, Theolonius. He's sitting with all these guys in all these sessions and play with them. Um, so the music always been in my family. It always been around. As, at four years old, I started playing drums. <laughs> How about okay. that? I started playing drums at four years old. And at the time, we had a record player that you had to stand over and look over. And there's the big TV on the record player. You had to look over into the turntable. I used to play the turntable. I didn't know what I was doing. You no know, DJing or nothing. But I was playing these James Brown records and, you know, these records with breaks in it. And it just it was just attractive to me as a little kid. So at eight years old, when hip hop came alive, that's when I started DJing. And from there on, I never stopped. And, you know, it all came from me growing up, knowing all the music, all the funk music and the soul music from my father and my grandfather. All right. It, it's it's rare for us to have someone that was actually raised in, in the epicenter of the culture. Um, could you typically just walk me through, uh, walk me through a day in which you are experiencing what we know as hip hop culture. Like what days do what days do these uh block parties happen? Like what's what's typical for like what they're DJing? What do the speakers look like? What what does the equipment look like? Just walk me through your observation of like uh back, uh a back, typical Bronx hip hop experience. Back in the days before there was hip hop records, it was just the break beats, it was just the MCs rhyming over the break beats. DJs uh, arguing over which records they could cut, like Freedom and Apache and I Can't Stop and records like that. Arguing? And arguing. Like, it, it would be it'd be crazy because it would be seven, eight DJs and one MC, right? And <laughs> because the DJ was so much more, it was so much more. To remember, the MC didn't come and be so prevalent until records came out. But when, when you had the Furious Five, we had Fantastic, we had Cold Crush, it was always the DJ first. Charlie Chase and the Cold Crush, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, you know, Grand Wizard Theater and the Fantastic. So it was always about the DJ more. Um, so they would argue about who would cut each re- what records they would cut because there were so many DJs on this party. Um, so that's what the, it was that. It was uh going to the record shop, trying to find the records and standing in the in the block parties and DJing in the rain. While it's raining and the crowd's still coming and they stand out there and party with you. You ain't making no money. You're blowing your equipment up, all that. But it was so much of we, we wanted to have so much fun and want people to see what we're doing that we didn't mind it. We just had we just went out there and did our thing. And it didn't matter what block it was at. We were set up on a pole, plug up to a pole. And that was the beginning of it. And we would just keep going from there. And this went on for a lot of years before records even came about. And even after records came about, it still went on. But before records came about, it was more contained. You know, and, and keep in mind, this is the time when they're telling us, yo, that's just noise y'all doing. Y'all ain't gonna last long. They ain't gonna be here long. What are y'all doing? 50 years later, I'm over here talking with Quest Love. Uh, thank you. Yo, so, okay. Like, all right, so technical questions I always wanted to know or uh, get answers to. So, you know, everyone knows, or at least, uh, for those that don't know, the legend, of course, of, of the first hip hop party, August 11th, 1973, mm-hmm. Cool Herc throws a party for his baby sister, Cindy, mm-hmm. and he gets this epiphany that he's just going to, instead of making you wait for the highlight, which, of course, like if you're playing a six, seven minute jam, 
um, there's always like a eight to 16 bar, 16 bar part of the song. That's the breakdown. That's the best part of the song. It's just the drums and everyone goes crazy for those 16 bars. And then it's over. And of course, Cool Herc's idea was like, let me just play all the drum breaks at once. You know, play Give It Up for Turn It Loose by James Brown and then play some by the, uh, you know, incredible bongo band. Just play the breaks. So I'm under the impression that these parties last for, what, five hours at least? Yeah, because when they used to, when, when uh, uh, the first time I heard hip hop, right. I'm on my block. This kid named, this guy named Joe, he has some dice in his hand. He's going, yes, yes, y'all, to the beat, y'all. And he's throwing the dice. And I'm standing there looking at him. I said, what do you mean, yes, yes, y'all? What is he saying? He's kept saying it. Yes, yes, y'all. To the beat, y'all. I'm like, yo, what's he saying? So that Friday, I went to uh, Marbury Hill Projects. They used to have the parties in the community center. You get to pay for a dollar to come in and go see Rockwell Incorporated. DJ B. Ward, Kevin Kev, Rockwell, all of them, they were right there. And I seen DJ B. Ward playing. And I seen the MC on the mic with the echo. Yes, yes, y'all, y'all. To the beat, y'all, y'all. I said, oh, shit. So I'm standing there watching. And then I ran home. I said, your mom want to be a DJ. She said, what's that? She bought me a mixer that had no headphone hole. It was a Gemini mixer. It was just a Phono 1, Phono 2, aux and a mic. No headphone, no plug to plug it in. And I had to guess all the spots on the record. That's how I got better than everybody else in the neighborhood. Because I had no headphones to work with. Right, I had no headphones away. And I'm eight years old standing on top of a milk crate. These older dudes are looking at me like, who this little kid's bugging? No headphones, busting their ass. And the girl named Olga Carter that was in our that was in our um circle, the young girl, she was 13 years old at the time. She said kick your priest sound like a good name for a DJ. At the time, my name was DJ Dr. Spank. It was a terrible name. But she said kick your priest sound like a good name for a DJ while we going in the classroom. I ended up trying to name six months later, she was shot and killed by a straight bullet by accident. Oh, so man. I ended up keeping the name. Yeah, uh, her name was Olga Carter. And, and, and I ended up keep, keeping the name, took me to the top. But I was there from the beginning watching all of this and, and being a part of it and seeing what it is. That's why I appreciate my career so much because it wasn't something that was just given to me. It was something I went through all of the phases of getting doors closed and everything that I had to do with just having, just learning the business and being a part of it and learning to appreciate what you have. When you and knowing when you didn't have it, you know what I'm saying? And, and I was there for that. So I appreciate it in a big way. So when you're spinning these records, and of course, like, you know, if you study the B-Boy Bible, um, of course, now like people know like the the foundational breaks of the culture, you know, like your let's dance by pleasure or get up and dance by uh, you know, freedom or or those particular records which weren't necessarily hits. You know, they these weren't songs that were played on radio. So what I want to know is, all right, so take take a break like um, Catch a Groove by Juice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a song that was not a radio song, it was not a hit, but yet was a staple for hip-hop parties. How do you, like, what is, what is, what would be, a, a DJ's version of like Cashbox Billboard magazine to know, oh man, I got to get Planetary Citizen because that has a drum break in it. Like, and how, how do you find these breaks? Like back in between, uh, you know, 77 to even 84 before like the Ultimate Beats and Breaks compilations were made, which put all those breaks on one record. I mean, how typical was it for you to go to uh, a local mom and pop record store to see, you know, uh, a bunch of James Brown, give it up for turn loose or funky drummers just like in the bin. You had like, to go to, you had to go to certain stores. And what would happen is a lot of stores started bootlegging records. When the DJ thing got big, when, when, when uh, hip hop started, like blow your head, blow your head was never a 45 or never a 12 inch. They made okay. a white label of Blow Your Head. So that was became so big. All these James Brown's Blow Your Head, out. yeah. Yeah, all the Apaches that came out was all bootleg Apaches. They, it was different different labels that put it out, like different, um, I guess, independent labels or whatever. So the, bootleg those like Bozo Miko labels and those Paul Winley all labels. Well, Paul, Winley, Paul Winley was official. Paul Winley was the one that put out the, the, the uh, Super Disco breaks. 
Right. He would get clearance for all these break beats and put them on these albums and put these albums out. But Cole Winley was the first one, was the one that put Chiba Chiba out with George Benson. Right. She, uh, yo, so he did that before the Super Disco bass. So he was in in that realm. And he did it, the, he kind of did it the right way. Um, but a, a lot of a, a lot of times, like a records was uh in downstairs records on 34th Street, uh um downtown. Uh, Forty Third Street. They, they would take these forty fives and make these forty fives of these downstairs records, and these forty fives would become just as important as finding the original record, because it was a limited amount of them. Like my man Louis Lou, he still have those downstairs records. Those downstairs records, like Planetary and Citizen, and records like that. These was were recorded. Planetary and Citizen was never forty five. So to have that is like a gem. You know what I'm saying? You're talking about a uh, breakbeat, Louis it. Louis Flores. No, my, my other man, Louis Lou, Louis Lou down, downtown. Okay. He, Louis Lou downtown, we grew up together. He was in 82, 83. This dude would have, he was, they used to call him Little Bambada. He had so much stuff way back then. And he's still collecting, like he's still doing it. So, you know, um, we was way ahead of the game. But a lot of stuff, like I said, a lot of stuff got bootlegged on 45. And that's how we got it. Because a lot of times, we didn't know the names and stuff. We didn't know what it was. And even more now that I got older, I didn't realize how much stuff was in the world. I got so much from work, Brazil and just so many different places around the world. But when we were coming up with the Accenture break beats, we didn't think that far. You know what I'm saying? We would we would we were going about what Bam was playing, what uh Charlie Chase was playing, what Flash and it was playing. We would that's how we knew what to play. And how we found out the names is because they were bootleg the records. You know what I'm saying? So that's how we would go. We go to the record shop, be a whole bootleg section. We just grab what we needed. We had it. I can't stop. White label. Like it was, that's how we got our people. Oh, okay. That explains it. Cause uh I was gonna say, um, maybe uh, five months ago, um, Cool Herc had auctioned off uh a, a good portion of 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 his gems and whatnot some artwork, some flyers, uh, memorabilia, and some of his records. So I copped um, like four or five of those records. And I was like, well, wait a minute. These are just white labels. These aren't the original ones. But I always wanted to know like how prevalent and how and how much of an abundance was like uh, an impeach the president back in 79, 80, 81, 82 you know, impeach, impeach. Uh, you know what? Impeach got more rarer to get in the later years. Earlier years, it was a little easier to get, but it still wasn't. It still wasn't something that anybody could just get. You know what I'm saying? Like you had to really know that beat. Like like Louis. He Louis was the first one I heard play that, and you know he was just so in depth with what was going on. You know what I'm right. saying? But the regular person that just wanted great beats, they didn't know impeach. They didn't know. They knew. They knew the regular things that they heard on the tapes, and then later on, the piece became more prevalent. What What year um, would you say was like the 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 highlight of or the pinnacle of Downtown Records? Like for you, if you're an upstart DJ, post say if you're like Pioneer 1.5. This is what I took from LO Pioneer 1.5. Like post Flash, post Theodore, and post Bam and and Hurt, is Downtown Records like your your mecca? Is that the only place? Like, where would you shop for records in New York City? Oh, Downtown, um, R and R Record on Fort on Fordham Road, um, Music World on Thirty Fourth Street. Uh, but what was interesting is that there used to be a Crazy Eddie. On Fordham yeah. Road in the Bronx. Oh, now, I remember wow. I was in Crazy Eddie this day, right? Check this out. I was in Crazy, Crazy Eddie's. Eddie's day. Yeah. And Cowboy and Mr. Ness, Scorpio, they walked in Crazy Eddie. They had on boots and leather and feathers and all that, but they were rock <laughs> stars to me. It was like looking at these dudes like, right? right? Okay, so they came in, seen them, they left. And this dude walks in with a box. Now, what they used to do with Crazy Eddie, they would take the new record that's out and put it on top of the uh, counter and play the album out in the store. This dude comes in with a box. They pull the record out, and it was Captain Sky Super Sperm. Boom. He puts it on top of the counter. He plays the album. The Super Sperm part comes in. I hear it run to the front. Yo, what the hell is that? 
Give me two of those. I bought two of those and I bought two Sears for cookies. I think I'm the very first dude with super sperm, man, because I was dead the day it came in. And it never really? it wasn't out before that. So I think I'm the very first dude with super sperm. And then they did uh and then they remade the album and put Dr. Rock on the album. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. So, but the original Super Sperm album didn't have Dr. Rock on it. And I was there that day and crazy Eddie the day it came in. So I was there in the I was trying to get everything at this time, but there wasn't a lot of places. I, I didn't know a lot of names and stuff, so I would just get it as I go. But Crazy Eddie started started bootlegging some records, <laughs> and he started putting stuff in. Yeah, For real? He putting stuff in. And then, of course, the street. Well, he is crazy. Yeah. Of course, the street, <laughs> right directly across the street from Crazy Eddie was R&R records, and they had all the breaks there. They had a lot of stuff there, so people would go over there and, and buy their stuff. But it, was, it wasn't a lot of places. Again, Burnside Avenue in the Bronx, they had a store over there that we used to always go to, and they had a lot of bootleg, 12 inches and stuff like that. And that's how we got it. Okay, so, and, and and forgive me for asking a lot of pedestrian DJ questions, but I feel like, you know, a, a bird in the hand is two in the bush, and, like, that's you right. know, you're, you're the closest to, to this era so I can get all my questions out. Mm -hmm. So if, okay, so how old were you, when you first started DJing, like your first block party, your your first party, nine. Okay, so equipment wise, um, how are you transporting this? Like, how far from your house is the destination for which you're going to DJ the gig, and how do you get it there? Like, I know if you're a nine year old. You're not carrying one turntable at a time, one mixer at a time, the table. So, like, my how do you organize? My, my building was here. The Turtle Park was right up the street. You set up right in front of the Turtle Park. Done. And then across the street was my school, directly across the street from my house. I could look out my window, look in the schoolyard. John Peter Tate taught 143. We used to do parties up in there, throw up in there. Everybody just come grab the equipment, bring it up, bring it down the street. And that's how we did it. Plug it up to the pole. And we was out there all day. So and then how we go to other blocks. Two questions. One, how loud is the system? And was it loud enough to, for at least your preferences, uh, to rock a party area? Or was it just as loud as a, a radio boom box? Or My block, first of all, was the main block everybody would come to because all the, it was just the fly dudes on the block. We just, we just had a way of carrying ourselves on our block. So all the different areas would come. So whenever we was out there with the system, that shit was super loud and people would just know from Fordham, from Marble Hill, from Fort Independence, from Heath Avenue, from Bailey Avenue, University, they would just hear the music. They would just know. Then the word of mouth would get around too. You know, kid is rocking out there, they doing a block party, whatever, and next thing you know, the whole block is small. Okay. Yeah, it used to be some crazy. So my second question is, how are you protected? Like, you know, as a nine-year-old, you're with turntables and a mixer and your records and whatnot. Is is there any situation of like a, let's say a visiting DJ from uh, uh, Queens? Come, first of all, are other boroughs allowed to come to your borough to, to represent like as a Bronx child? Are you allowed to go to Brooklyn to spend that block party or like are you staying yeah. just where you know? No, I would go where I was invited everywhere because I got at, at a young age early on, my name traveled real quick. So I would go anywhere. The problem was, but you could go anywhere, but if you wasn't good, you get your ass beat. So if like if you come from the Bronx, you go to Brooklyn and you was not good, you may have a problem. If you don't, they love you. So it, <laughs> it was that type of thing. Has there, so I wanted to know, has there been situations of like, Oh, yo, we're 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 taking his turntables, or never ever. We're still not for you, but do you know of stories of like, ah, uh, man, he got his mix oh, jacked, yeah. or oh yeah, I've been to block parties where dudes got guns put, DJs got put guns put out. How are you protected from that action, and how often would that happen? It never happened to me because I was rolling. I had you know my dudes was gonna make sure I was all right, but I think right. I'm gonna tell you this um question. Even to now, all the you know, all the try two hundred shows a year. Even as now, it's the I don't carry that aura that people wanted to do things to me and 
you know, it was never like that. I never, I never went in other people's neighborhood and acted funny or, you know, treated people funny. You know, I, I just never did that. So I never had that problem of, yo, what you doing here? We're going to rob you or any of that. I never had that energy, but I always had people around me to make sure that I was straight. You know what I'm saying? And I never went places that I didn't, I wasn't straight. I mean, I, I've been to some dangerous, dangerous places, but right. I, I was always good. But my energy make people feel a certain way. So I don't really get that. Even the most gangster was dudes, you know? Well, okay. The, the reason why I asked you this question, because I, I actually asked Dre this question, uh, you know, pre NWA where, you know, and I, you know, I asked him about, um, so if you remember the scene in Straight Outta Compton where he is about to play um, Marvelette's uh, Please Wait, Mr. Postman, and he mixes it with Planet Rock. Mm -hmm. And Dre explains to me, like, yo, that was, like, such a risk for me to do because he was, like, unlike those other parties, you know, like, at any other party, they might give you one chance to spin a dud that they don't feel and you might have 20 seconds to fix it but you know Dre was explaining to me that he was spinning at a spot that was absolutely relentless and not forgiving at all for like the wrong record so mm -hmm. for him to take such a risk like he knew in order for him to make a mark he had to take a risk and it's like mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna make them think I'm gonna play some old Motown shit. Then they're gonna get upset. Then when I have Planet Rock, they're gonna be like, "Oh shit!" So he was like purposely saying that he had to lower expectations, but just fast enough to elevate them. So, like, what space does that leave you as a creative? You know, because you know, I told you as I explained at the top of the show that um, you were big on like these these classic mixes of like mixing R&B with hip hop and uh, this acapella with that song and, you know, things that at least for, you know, maybe it was typical in New York, but I wasn't getting that in Philly. So like mm -hmm. you were the first tape DJ that we were, that I was getting in the late eighties, early nineties, like when I was in high school and whatnot. So how would you find the space to experiment, to see if something works? Well, first let me say this, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of great things. I'm a fan of good music. I'm a fan of good groups and just music, just everything about it. I'm a fan. When I when I go to my shows and do my shows, I look at myself as a person in the crowd watching myself and how would I want to feel if I was that person watching me? What would make a promoter want to bring me back? What would make these people want to pay to come to see me again? I think like them. So with that, I like things that are good. I don't put a date on things. If it's good, it's good. And when it's good, it's timeless to me. And, and, and I could take something that will be unusual, nobody ever heard before, never heard it, um, don't know nothing about it, and make it sound like it's familiar. It's just the way, it's just the way it comes across. Keep in mind, Questlove, we DJs, anybody can play these records. Anybody can play these records. It's how you play it. It's mm -hmm. the impact you give. I, I'm always an impact dude, a, a element of surprise. What's going to make it go to the next level? What's going to make these people feel better than they did before they seen me? What, you know what I'm saying? And how can I make them feel like they're never going to ever go to another event that's going to be better than this? They're never going to feel that feeling. That's my focus. So with that, I'll try certain things. Even if, you know, I was the one that started playing records and taking it off in the fourth bar. And the reason why I was doing that is because I had Def Comedy Jam television show and I was doing the, com the, the concerts. And I only had a 15 minute set. So I had to play records quick. And I'm watching these people go into a frenzy every time I play this record quick. I throw one on. And if you pit, and if, if you don't throw the right one on after each other, you'll piss somebody off. So it has to be the right one that's going to make them forget that one that they like, that they want to hear that you're cutting off. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching these big crowds losing their mind to this, to this. So I applied it to the parties. And then I seen it working the parties and, you know, DJs follow that. But you don't need a whole lot. You, sometimes you play a record too long, it gets boring. Sometimes the hook is just the best part. Sometimes this, the count-off is the best part. Sometimes the intro is the best part and you can lean into something else. 
but that's building a continuity. That's build. That's that's painting a picture for people and kind of giving them a story from beginning to middle to end. You kind of tell a story. And I've had somebody tell me that he was like, "Yo, I see you. I've been to six of your shows. It's like you're trying to talk to us. It's like you're trying to tell us a story." And that's exactly right. what I'm doing. So if you play, I can play Sam for the Sun. Quincy Jones, Sam for the Sun. Boop, 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 boop. Right in the middle of the party. The way I play it, make the crowd go crazy. But if I play mm -hmm. it a different way, they'll look at me like, what the hell is he doing? Right. So it's all the way, it's all in the presentation. It's all how you deliver it. And I've been very lucky with that.